Punishment is not something that most people look forward to. Vengeance and discipline or revenge is not something that most people look forward to experiencing. We tend to have a negative perspective of punishment. Punishment is defined by Webster's Dictionary as to penalize for an offense. Even though it didn't happen to me that often, when I was in grade school, I feared going to the principal's office. I feared going to the principal's office for primarily two reasons. First, because I knew that the principal had the final authority to punish me. And secondly, he also had the authority, or she had the authority, to carry out the punishment. And it is the same way with God, in which reason where everybody should fear God is because God is sovereign. The sovereignty of God is the theological premise that God is the highest authority, and therefore God answers to no one. God can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do, and how he wants to do it. That's right. And so because the Bible gives us um, a wonderful caution about his authority by saying that he is slow to anger. He is slow to wrath. He is abounding in love because that is the very character of God. So to put it this way, because God has the ability to have life and death in his very breath, he chooses not to destroy us when we are sinful in our nature and in our actions. And because of his loving nature, he slows his anger and his wrath because he wants us to be like-minded like him because we have the capacity to destroy or to punish. He wants us to relinquish that capacity and that the abundance of our true nature and character may be expressed to everyone. In other words, we have to see it this way. There was a story told about a farmer who had turned into an evangelist. And he went from farm to farm trying to get everyone to observe the commandments of God and to follow Christ Jesus. So he went to the first farmer's house that he saw. And he says, well, my brother, are you ready for uh, the big day that's coming? And the, and, the, and, the, and the farmer said to him, he says, well, my birthday was last week. And he says, well, what I'm trying to say to you is, he says, is that, and he says, you got your ticket in your hand. And the man says, well, I'm not planning to travel anywhere else this year. And the farmer began to get more frustrated. He said, what I'm trying to say to you, are you ready for judgment day? And the farmer said back to him, let me go get my wife and me and her go together both days. The problem is the same for the church is, is that when it comes to telling dying men and women, we are not specific at what the consequences are of a sinful nature, the consequences of an unrepentant life, the consequences of not accepting Christ as your personal Savior means that you will be subject to the wrath that will come upon this sinful world. A world that will surely die an imminent death, not only a physical death, but a spiritual death. But those of us who have accepted Christ as our personal Savior, we may die in this physical body, but we have been promised to live again. I knew that the principal had the final authority to decide whether if I was going to be punished for the wrong that I've done, and more importantly, he had the power or she had the power to decide how it was going to be carried out. What I'm saying to us is that God has a decree. He has declared that the church must be prepared for Jesus' return and the coming judgment. Jesus said, watch ye therefore, it's for you know not when the day or the hour that the Son of Man cometh. But it may be in the morning, it may be in the afternoon, it may be in the evening, but he wants us to be like that song that says, be ready when he comes again. The lack of preparation expressed by professed believers confuses unbelievers about the promise of Jesus' return. 
It appears at many times that, that the believers uh, are unmoved by the uh, superfluous amount of unbelievers that we have around us. It seems uh, that we are unmoved and unbothered by the very fact that those around us uh, do not know Jesus. Believe it or not, Greenville County is the largest mission field in the state of South Carolina. There are 440,000 people in Greenville County and less than 100 150,000 of them go to anybody's church. We send an unspoken message that the fate of human souls is irrelevant to the Christian cause. We live in a dying world because of the nature of sin. Paul says in his Roman letter that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We serve a God that loves us, but he will not reward us for a sinful life. We serve a God that will forgive us, but he is not going to exalt us from doing what we know is already wrong. We serve a God who will look beyond our faults, but he will not negate that it is a fault. And therefore, he wants us to be ready when Jesus returns. We live in a dying world. Because of the sins of Adam and Eve. We live in a world where human judgment for sin is not carefully executed. And even in many cases, the judgment and punishment for sin is not even expected. Uh, uh, we, we realize that Michael Vick uh, went to jail for two years uh, for fighting dogs. Uh, but, but Casey Anthony can kill her daughter and get to be able to write a book about it. Human judgment is not always just. Human judgment is not always justified. Mega Evers was killed in his front yard in cold blood in Jackson, Mississippi. And it took his murderer to go to trial three times before he finally was convicted. We live in a dying world because of the nature of sin. We live in a world where human judgment for sin is not carefully executed, nor in many cases even expected. Christ died for the sins of humanity. His death, resurrection, and his imminent return are the core principles of our faith. We at Christmas time celebrate that he was born. We at Easter time celebrate that he died and he resurrected. But most importantly, as we are now believers, we need to be able to share the clear message to those who have yet to accept him in their hearts. And that message is that one day he's coming back. We don't know the day or the hour. We don't know if it's going to be morning or at noon. But every day of our lives is needed to be with careful preparation of the complete knowledge and belief that Jesus will return. Amen. The epistle to the Thessalonians was written because the church at Thessalonica had immediate expectations for the return of Jesus the Christ. This was perhaps the first letter that Paul had wrote to any church in his missionary journeys throughout Asia Minor. Paul was writing to the church at Thessalonica perhaps almost 21 years after the ascension of Jesus the Christ, helping them to understand the detailed sequence of events of what would take place after Jesus had ascended to heaven and when he would return to heaven. Many have had wondered had their loved ones uh, who had died after his ascension uh, had they already gone uh, unto that city where the streets are paved with gold uh, had grandmama and great grandmama uh, already received the keys uh, to that mansion that he promised uh, beyond the sky uh, had all those uh, who had died in the Lord uh, already experienced uh, the pearly gates of heaven Paul in the fourth and fifth chapter Help to correct the understanding and the misguided notion that grandmama was already in heaven with Jesus. 
He got them to understand that behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In the Corinthian letter, he says, he says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. That change does not take place simply by hanging around in a post-9-11 world. That change does not take place simply by being waking up in the morning and lying down in your bed at night. That change takes place when you have accepted Jesus in your heart. And when he comes back, he's going to take all of those who already have died into heaven first. And those of us who are still alive shall be caught up to meet him in the air. This is why we need to be clear and letting our children and our grandchildren know that grandmama is not in heaven right now with Jesus. Because Jesus had to go to hell before he went to heaven. So if Jesus didn't go directly to heaven when he died, what makes you think grandma goes directly to heaven when she died? She's on her way. But not until Jesus returns. Paul said the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those who already had accepted Christ as their personal Savior and now had been asleep in the, the, in the grave, they now will be ascended to God with Christ in heaven. Amen. Then the rapture in which God had told Jesus about the appointed hour in which he would come back to earth and that he would receive those who were faithful and just to receive him as their savior. Then we would be caught up to meet him in the air and the days after grandmama and those of us who believe have gone on into heaven to be with the Lord are not a pretty picture. The wrath of God the judgment of God would now be upon those who had yet to believe. Paul is assuring us that just as sure as the sun rises and sets each and every day, that the wrath of God is sure to happen just as the setting of the sun. This implies that there was going to be a violent rage, a fury, and a punishment on those who had yet to believe. We would do well to prepare ourselves for the coming wrath by confessing our sins and receiving Christ as our Savior. The wrath is coming whether you like it or not. The wrath is coming whether it's your birthday or your wedding anniversary. The wrath is coming whether it's your time for a promotion or it's your time to get engaged. Wherever it may be, no matter where you are, you better be ready when it comes again. So the question that's raised today if Jesus is coming back and the certainty of his return is certain as the sun rising and the sunset, how do we as modern day believers prepare for his return? We need to know three things and three very important things about our purpose and our role as modern day believers in this dying world. The first thing that we need to understand is that we have been picked out for a purpose. To be saved simply means that you have been delivered from sin and delivered to service. In other words, your purpose of being saved is not so that you could be with grandmama in the mansion in the sky. That's not God's immediate concern. That's your final destination. But your immediate purpose is to be brought out of the little mountain cafe and brought into the kingdom of God. To be brought out of the world that tells us that abortion is okay. To be brought out of the world that tells us that fornication is okay. To be brought out of the world that says it's okay to, to, for men to marry men and for women to marry women. You have been picked out of that for a purpose. Paul uses the word in the Greek for elected eklogen, which means election. It literally means choosing. It literally means what is selected or chosen. 
In other words, it would be nice if God could count on everybody to do his will. It would be nice is that when we wake up with the sun rising in our faces and the beautiful birds chirping in our ears, that we would give thanks unto the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. But some of us have failed to understand our true purpose. Even though David said, let everything that have breath. Praise the Lord. You got people that come to church Sunday after Sunday and you almost got to shake them just to get them to say amen. Everybody does not understand their purpose. But for those of us who do, Paul reminds us in verse number four that knowing your election brothers loved of God. You know why you're here. You know that you're here to tell somebody about Jesus. You know that your praise is supposed to bring somebody else through. 